All right. Well, today on the show, we are excited to have Justin Early with us. Justin, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Doing really good. Doing really good. Justin, thanks so much for coming on. I would love to start off with uh, just you sharing your story uh, because you are a lawyer and you had right. in, yeah. in your book, you talk about how you just had a tremendous sense of calling to go into that field. Can you talk about that some more? I'd love to talk about that. One of the things I love to talk about actually is work, vocation, calling. Mm -hmm. So I started my career, so to speak, as a missionary in Shanghai, China. My wife and I lived there for almost five years. And I tell people we loved it. We would have kept doing it maybe for our whole lives, <laughs> except that I had a calling experience that really changed the course of my life. Um, I was on the streets of Shanghai, China. And to keep things short for the purpose of the podcast, I, I encountered in the space of five minutes on the same street, a um, black market sort of thief dealer of laptops, hmm. um, prostitutes and brothels, a drug dealer, and a political protester. And uh, you can imagine which one was instantly clamped down on the police arrested and it was the political protester. And it was one of those epiphany moments for me where I thought, you know, of the four things that I've seen today, all four are technically illegal in China. Um, three of them are harmful to your neighbor. One of them actually was an act of brave love for the neighbor. And that's the one that the system killed. Um, and when I say killed, I mean, metaphorically, I have no idea if this woman was just arrested and let off the other side of the street or put in a gulag in the Western part of China. I have no idea. But it was this moment for me where I realized that the way we set up our law, the way we set up our economics, I mean, three of these activities were ways to make good money, you know, selling drugs, selling your body, selling black market goods. They, they, you know, people were incentivized to do them because it worked. Right. And it made me realize the way we set up our, our societies from law and economics and more, they change plausibility structures for morality. They change the way we could imagine life. And as a missionary, I just had this moment where I was like, I want to be missional within that space. I, I want to be, you know, I fully believe in proclaiming the gospel verbally to people and seeing them come to Christ like we saw in China. It was amazing. But I just had this calling moment where I, was, I, I want to work in law and business and figure out how to bend those structures to help the flourishing of God and neighbor. So I ended up applying to law and business school within within a month of that experience. And uh, here I am now, uh, almost three years of law school and then now five, six years of lawyering. And um, I do feel like it's, it's my calling. I love it. Yeah. I wonder what the response has been to you using that language, because for some reason in the church, that language has been reserved, that calling language that's been reserved for pastors, people going into vocational ministry. I, I just love that you use that language to say you felt called to, to be a lawyer. Yeah. Like you need to recover that big of a vision. Right. And what what's what's the response been to that? I think I think people are usually encouraged yeah. by this and I think they should be. Um the only part that I would caveat and I wouldn't want to discourage people is it it is not it is unusual I think to get such a clear clarion moment where the Lord says, go do this. And that, that was kind of true for me where it just felt like I was like everything short of him audibly speaking. I sort of felt the confidence that he was leading me into law and business. That may not be true for everybody and yeah. that's fine, but there are other ways to discern your calling. I mean, what are you good at? What do you love and you care about? What do other people think you're good at? <laughs> you know, somewhere at the intersection of those things is often your calling. But what I would suggest is the important part here is that we should see our nine to five as probably the central way that we're going to love and serve our neighbors. I mean, it is our mission in the world. I don't think we should just look at it as the way to produce money that we can then give to the church or give to missions. That's, we should. But I mean, the way that I go about my lawyering, the institutions that I support, as a lawyer, um, the deals that I help close with businesses, the businesses that I assist, I mean, they have real life world changing impacts right here in the regular nine to five. And I think when I say calling on like an everyday basis, I mean, real life thinking about your, your work matters, whether it's a stay at home parent, an accountant, a lawyer, construction, or whatever it is, you do it because it really matters. Um, and so I think that way about lawyer. I don't think there's this as a 
sub tier thing. And now I write and speak, you know, do Christian books. And I, that's my real calling. No, no, I, I see myself as a lawyer who also gets the opportunity to write and speak sometimes. I love it. I love that vision. And so, so there you were there, you, you pursued that calling and you begin the book with you telling the story of how you found yourself in the emergency room with panic attacks. Right. What led to that moment? Well, here's what, jumping off the point of calling, Mm -hmm. I went to law school with all the fervor of a man on a call. You know, I saw it as like the, the great thing I'm going to do for the Lord now. Um, And the advantage of that was, you know, I thought of it as like a realm of excellence. Like I need to apply myself fully. Um, And I did. And I managed to graduate, you know, towards the top of my class. Um, I had great work opportunities, but I fully sort of assimilated to the way of life of a top law school student, which was, you know, always burning the candle at both ends, always adding more to my plate and schedule, always being, you know, on call, alert to the next task. And that was totally the life I went into as a first year associate at a big law firm doing international mergers and acquisitions. And I see in retrospect that while this content of calling, this was, this was real, um, but it was kind of the decoration on the house of my life. If I looked at the architecture of my life then, it was made up of the same habits as everybody else's. And those ended up collapsing. I ended up in the emergency room having panic attacks in my first year of lawyering. And I, I had no idea why, but I remember it was rather anticlimactic because I'd never experienced anything like this before. And a doctor just told me, you know, you're experiencing s- symptoms of clinical anxiety. This is really common which was supposed to be comforting to me. And obviously it wasn't. Um, I was waking up in the middle of the night, you know, hands shaking, heart beating. Um, it, it, so, you know, I could tell something was, was really wrong. And I went through a really, really hard time. Um, it lasted about a year, but there, there was a tipping point towards the end of that year where I had tried some medication, tried some counseling and both of those things, medication kind of hurt, counseling kind of helped, but neither were real game changers. But at the end of a year, my wife and I, had this sort of idea, like, let's, let's get some habits and rhythms just to govern your, the chaos of your life. This was really the chaos management. It, it wasn't something that I thought was going to be a big solution. It was just, I needed help. I was sort of in distress. Um, and we needed st- something to change. And so I remember sitting down with two of my best friends and committing to living according to a program of daily and weekly habits, just as a way to try to try something to help the panic and the anxiety that I was having. And I'm here now, you know, years later, um, saying that those habits ended up changing my life. (laughs) They were Mm -hmm. small things. I didn't think they were going to matter because then I didn't know how significant the small patterns of our life were. I had no idea that the smallest habits of our days and weeks actually affect our souls um, in the deep. And it's it's definitely our mental health, definitely our emotional health, but also like the life of the soul, our spiritual life in really significant and extraordinary ways. And so beginning at that time, coming out of crisis, I started really paying attention to what are the daily and weekly rhythms in my life and how are they shaping me, mind, body, and soul? And why would I assimilate to someone else's patterns and rhythms instead of looking at the call to follow Jesus and saying, I'm going to follow Jesus right here in my profession in America as a lawyer with different rhythms, kind of like Daniel um, you know, said to the, to the Kings, like, I, I'll serve you, but I'm going to eat my food, you know, and pray my prayers and see if I'm not, you know, healthier. And that's sort of the commitment. And of course, the, the technical term for this is a rule of life, which we can, we can get into. But that was the story that led me from collapse of panic to all right now really digging into spiritual formational habits. Yeah. What's fascinating about that is, you know, you, you came to that moment and, and that led you to think about habits, ultimately rule of life. But you hear that story so many times from people that, that, that they're, you know, they're followers of Jesus. Like you said, the, the exterior of the house is Christian and maybe they hit some kind of wall or they're just really ambitious. They're busy. You talk about this in the book and, and they hit that wall or they're really ambitious or that sort of thing. They've assimilated to those around them. Like you talk about, but they just drill down. Yes. They just keep going down that path. You went another route. Why do you think that, that that's the response we so often see? You know, I hit a wall, I crash, 
I, this is not working. Let's, mm. let's just continue down this path. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I can, I think I can only say that there's a lot, there's been a lot of grace and providence in, in my own life. Um, mm. You know, I, when I talk about habits as an antidote to the modern chaos we live in, there's nothing new to it. There's really the spiritual disciplines, prayer, scripture reading, fasting, community, um, you know, presence and silence. It's like classic stuff just applied to our modern moments of smartphones and computers and busy work schedules. And I say that just because, you know, I looked back and started reading how do other people think about living well in the time they were in? Hmm. Um, so, you know, it wasn't my idea. And I also think there's a lot of grace and providence in that, you know, I, I just think the Lord um, used my collapse and crisis to teach me something. And, you know, my friends and my family who helped me and who read and thought along with me, you know, I don't, the, the, the sad and weird thing is without crisis and without my friends and family and without the history of the church to be able to read about stuff like this, like I, I have nothing here, right? So, so I don't know why I probably would have kept just bearing down and doing the same thing, just like everybody else. But I think the Lord um, graciously intervened. And so now I can say, you know, really confidently that, you know, to some, anyone who's listening and is experiencing something like this or knows somebody like this, you know, we, we have to, as a church, we've got to think about the way that habits are forming us. Mm -hmm. I would suggest our generation, probably in America, thinks relatively well about the way worldview is forming us and about the way you, you really have to believe you have to think think about what you're living and think about what your faith is think about what you're committed to think about what your idols are and that is totally true it is also true that we can act completely otherwise i mean we're familiar with the idea of hypocrites and we most of us are one we can think a certain way and really want to live that way and end up by habit going the exact opposite direction all the time that's the difference between education and formation. Yeah. Um, education are the things that we think about, the things that we know, the things that are taught. Formation, these are the things that we just kind of gut react to, we do, these are the things that are caught. And the life of a disciple is, I would say, like a DNA helix of education and formation. And if you only think about, as I did, what do you believe, and then live like everybody else, it often totally undercuts what you believe. You find yourself worshiping other idols, even though you're proclaiming Jesus. You find yourself functionally a slave to your smartphone or pornography or some drug or some relationship or you're a workaholic or something um, because our, our patterns are completely chaotic. And so, you know, when I write about this in the book, I, start to th I think about the idea of an, a rule of life as a way to pattern belief and practice alongside each other so that our knee jerk habits are the kinds of habits that would lead us to the Lordship of Jesus Christ on a daily basis and help form us in the love of God and neighbor, not just teach us about it, but help form us in it. Yeah. Can you just talk about why the habits that we have, why are they so formative in our lives? Yes. Uh, let me give an explanation and an example. Um, the explanation is both neurological and theological. So neurologically speaking, you know, neur neurologists would tell you that when habit activity kicks in, your brain almost kind of shuts down and habits can just sort of go under the radar. This is why, you know, you and I can leave our house and make all the right turns on the way home without ever thinking about it uh, because we're doing something else more important with our brain, maybe thinking about a work conversation or talking on the phone or listening to the radio. So w this is great when it's a good habit. This, this hamstrings us when it's a bad habit. Because we might know the way we incessantly check emails or that website we keep going to or the way we constantly talk to our spouse, even though we don't want to. We might know these things are wrong, but the part of our brain that knows it's wrong is not the part that's chugging along in the habit. And this is the education and formation thing. When your head goes this way, but your habit goes that way, the reality is, you know, which way is your heart going to go? It is more likely than not to go that way. Hearts follow habits because formation sort of develops you in knee-jerk reactions and loves. Your heart moves towards those kind of idols. So I think to understand habits on a spiritual level, everyday mundane habits should be understood as little liturgies. And liturgies are things that, you know, this can be like a high church formal word. I don't necessarily want people to think about it like that. I just want 
them to think about habits in the sense of liturgies are things that lead us in patterns of worship to something. Theoretically, it's a church service that leads us in the pattern of worship to the triune God, and we become formed in his image. But the similarity between liturgy and habit is that they both um, become somewhat rote, they become semi-conscious, they happen over and over, and they form us. Both of them form us. The difference is liturgy owns up to the fact that it's worship. Habits often obscure what we're worshiping, and that's the problem, hmm. because we're never not worshiping. We're always worshiping something. The question is just what? And so our daily mundane habits can often lead us into worship of idols of busyness or being limitless or being omnipresent by checking your phone and being everywhere, by being omniscient, by always reading up on everything, but never focusing on anything. Um, these are idols. You know, these are ways we try to be God instead of worship him and become like him. And so my, what I want people to see is that under the radar, your everyday mundane habits can be leading you in worship of, of, of awful things, and you become like what you worship. You become your habits. So that's how they form us. For example, though, what this looked like in my life, um, I, often, I often go through my pre-anxiety crash routine with people, and uh, it would be, you know, wake up short on sleep again because I never go to bed on time. This liturgy of limitlessness, like I'm a machine or a god, I don't need physical limits. Um, the idea that I would roll over, check my work email first thing every morning. I see now there is this liturgy of, I can miss a quiet time, even though I'd like to do that every morning. I can miss one, but I can't miss a quick reply to my office because if I'm not well-regarded at my office, well, who am I? That sneaking sense of identity just comes into email checking, right? Um, third habit, I grab breakfast on the go. Everybody else gets somewhere late. I probably eat lunch at my desk. Um, the idea there that being too busy is not only acceptable, but maybe even good because everybody wants my time. That means everybody wants me. Um, one last one, I keep my computer and notifications on and in sight while I work. Um, there's this sort of idea that what's most recent is most important and what's urgent is relevant. You know, all, So this stuff, I look back on that and I think, well, no wonder my mind and my body were stressed. I mean, that is a, those are significant routines of worship to omniscience, omnipresence, being somebody who is bigger than myself, not respecting the limits of being a creature that God created, you know? Mm. And so, you know, I think a lot of us fall into those kind of normal patterns and don't think they're that significant. We might think they're sort of unhealthy, but we don't realize how spiritually significant they are. And so a lot of the patterns that I write about in The Common Rule are specifically intended to undercut these modern routines, like scripture before phone, disrupting that pattern of the morning, turning your phone off for an hour each day, having a communal meal each day, um, fasting from something occasionally, doing a real Sabbath. These are not things to check off the list so you can feel good about your life. They're intentional spiritual rhythms that happen on a daily or weekly basis. They're supposed to be really small, but undercut really big, bad habits. Mm -hmm. And that's the power, I think, of, of this stuff. It's that it's not like a life hack. Hey, this new one trick will just, you know, give you a new spiritual life, but it is disproportionately significant to what you think there are. I mean, you, you, you change your morning rhythm um, to scripture before phone and something fundamental will shift in your morning routine. It's a little habit with tiny habit with mega consequences. And so I try to write about those kind of habits. Psychologists call them keystone habits. Um, you change one little thing and a lot of big things change. And I just say, because, you know, life is hard. Habits are hard. It's hard to follow Jesus. This is not supposed to make it e easy. It's just supposed to be, say, like, here is where the, the big things are. The big things are actually in the little things. And if we want to be big disciples, we want to be really true, genuine disciples, we got to look at these little moments and ask how they're forming us. Yeah. And so, so all of that is wrapped up in what you referred to earlier, the rule of life. And mm -hmm. I feel like a, a rule of life is, is so much bigger than the way that we kind of paint the picture of spiritual growth. A lot of times, mm -hmm. all those normal spiritual disciplines are in there, but, but rule of life, it, it, it just consumes everything. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about how the rule of yes. life might be different than the way that we think about spiritual growth? Yeah, and many people won't even know what a rule of life is, so it's yeah. worth just defining the term, right? So a rule of life, it's sort of an 
ancient monastic-ish way of talking about a pattern or program of communal habits. Now, in the strictest sense, a rule of life would be sort of you're in a monastery and you have, you know, your daily readings and your daily prayers and your fast days and your feast days and your, your work and your communal gatherings. It's sort of this, it's the way you live together, but it doesn't need to be that formal at all. The insight of a rule of life, which, which does owe its heritage uh, to the monastics, particularly St. Augustine, um, St. Benedict, but it, it has its roots in the Daniel idea again of, I'm living here in this time, but I'm gonna live differently for the sake of this time. So what I don't want people to think is that a rule of life is some sort of like shutting out the world so that I can live according to my own safe, comfortable practices. Yeah. It's quite the opposite. It's saying, if we're gonna love the world, we need to be formed not in the image of the world, but in the image of God, so that we can reach out in love to the world. You know, you don't have anything to give unless you're actually formed in Christ. And so the idea of the a rule of life is, and it's been used by many spiritual communities across thousands of years, it's the idea of what are the patterns and the practices that you need to put in place communally in order to live the kind of life that leans towards love and God of neighbor and doesn't just get assimilated into the current culture. It's, it's really a, um, a countercultural posture, but for the sake of loving the culture, which I think is you know, we could do a whole different podcast on this. I, I really think the rule of life offers a, a cultural posture for the Christian, mm. a way to not just be cordoned off, not just to assimilate, not just to reject, but to distinguish yourself for the sake of the love of culture. We, that's probably a different discussion. But the point is, a rule of life offers that kind of communal formation. And the idea of it, the word rule, people are going to hear, you know, these are a set of rules you have to obey. That's not, that's not what the original language meant at all. It's just the language we've inherited. The Latin root, um, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, regulare, regular, the, the word connoted a bar or a trellis. Um, it translates into English as rule. But the idea is, how do you build a framework, a, a trellis? for the, the plant of life to glow on, grow on. So you, what we would think of is, how do we build a trellis of habit on which the love of God and neighbor can grow? What kind of habits will we put in place to structure our days and week so that we can actually grow in that direction? Which brings us to the most important point, I think, of the rule of life. And that is that it is not constricting, it is freeing. Mm. It, it, it is a totally wrong idea to think of, oh, if I'm gonna put in place spiritual disciplines, then I'm going to be, you know, hemmed in by these things I have to do, and it's going to be legalistic. No, I mean, the, we're, we think that way, I think, because we're American, and we think freedom is the absence of all limitations. Like, I get the freedom choice to make any decision I want in a given moment. That is not freeing. That is enslaving, because, because we, we, are not, we are not God. There's always going to be something pressuring us or turning us. We are not free to choose. Life is full of nudges either gentle or significant people who would like to manage our life for us if we don't realize that if, if you want to say for example i want to be free to check my phone whenever i want well the iphone and its programmers is probably going to make sure that you check it pretty often so by saying i want to be free you're actually going to be a slave but put in place a limit you know do not disturb notifications silence it put it away sometimes then you actually start to become free and the idea there is the biblical idea of freedom is choosing the right master it's not being free from all limitations. It's choosing the right limitations so that you can do what you are made to do, not do whatever you want to do. And the rule of life in that sense is patterning your life in a set of habits, communal practices, ideally, that leads you in the freedom. It is for freedom that Christ set us free, the freedom to be able to love God and neighbor and not assimilate to the enslaving burdens of modern contemporary culture. So a rule of life, I have found, is one of the most freeing endeavors you can get but you get to freedom ironically through discipline but that's the biblical route you know that's that's we discipline ourselves into freedom yeah i love that image there that 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 we're doing these things to work for freedom to move towards freedom so it's not a rule of life you know in order just to have some rules and discipline in our lives just as an end in itself it's we're doing this to be to experience freedom Yes. And I mean, I, I, I tell people often, and I write in the book, um, 
none of these habits are going to earn God's love. That's right. You know, that, that much is clear. Like we, we know that, you know, our daily and weekly habits won't change the way that God loves us. The whole idea here though, is if God loves us the way that he unconditionally loves us, then we probably ought to change our daily and weekly habits to reflect, conform, and lean into that. It's possible to respond or not to respond to God's love. And so this is why none of this is a legalistic endeavor, but a, a grace soaked response to saying, if you really love me that unconditional, if your love actually sets me free, how do I pattern my life in that love? Because I want that. Mm-hmm. I want that. You know, I want to live like that. And I want to extend that to other people. And, uh, you know, our actions and our, have consequences, mm-hmm. you know, so we can either resist the love of God and the love of neighbor in our, in our habits, or we can embrace it. And a rule of life helps us actually live into the freedom of you. You can embrace it. You can be free to love God and neighbor and not be enslaved by all this stuff. And that's the path Christ is calling you down. That's why, you know, he describes himself as the, the light yoke, but it is a yoke. You know, it's, a, it's an easy yoke and a light burden, but it is the burden. I mean, you do restrict yourself, but he is the, he's the only master out there who loves you. Hmm. All the other ones don't care about you. Um, and the question is, again, not whether we're going to have a master, it's who's going to be our master. Yeah. So let's dive into some of the habits there that you, you talk about in the book. Two of them, two, uh, two of them in the book, you specifically focus on your phone. And so yeah. in the book, you talk about one hour with your phone off and then scripture before phone. And the way that you, one of the ways you, you tie those in is you talk about presence. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it? Uh, how, how is our addiction to our phone affecting our, our ability to be present? Yes, yes. This is a really big one. That's why a lot of the habits in the common rule are technology driven. Um, Because I'm trying to look at the spiritual disciplines and say, how do they apply with the modern challenges of technology? And presence is a huge one. If you think about it, you can read the biblical story in a narrative of presence. And it makes sense. Um, We're created to be present with God, like walk with him in the Garden of Eden and present with each other. Um, it is sin that ruins presence. It is sin that makes Adam and Eve embarrassed to be around each other without clothing to shield part of their presence. It is presence that, um, it is sin that makes them hide from God in the garden. It is sin that drives them eventually out of the garden, out of God's presence. But the story of the Old Testament is a story of God coming after his people to be with them again. Even though their sin drove them out, he's after them. And he's coming up, you know, in smoke and fire and tents and tabernacles and all of these things, maybe a, a pastor or a theologian's words of these theophanies. These are manifestations of God's presence with his people. The, the narrative is driving towards then the New Testament where Emmanuel comes, God is with us. And of course, the Holy Spirit, the deposit of God's presence and, and the end in Re- Revelation where, you know, we're happy together again. It's a fairy tale. of so it's like we're happily ever after. Everybody's together again. The, the wedding is consummated. Um, th- th- that's all to say, I want to convince people that presence, to be with God and be with people is our spiritual DNA. It's how we were created to live. And when it is very possible to live a life of absence in general, but particularly now, with the temptations of distraction, the temptations of constantly being everywhere by checking all your messages and, you know, tuning into too many importance and never actually being somewhere with someone. Mm-hmm. So when I look at the phone, I think of it as a phenomenal tool if used well, but that's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, the default setting, I think, is that it fractures our presence and that has consequences. So when I talk, so one of the habits that um, to get at this, and this will give you an idea of how we're using a little habit to try to get at a much bigger discipline, that the habit would be turning your phone off for an hour each day. But the idea there is that every believer needs to realize their their presence with their spouse, their family, their friends, their work, their quiet times is probably being fractured by the smartphone. And one of the habits to undo that is to introduce a stopping mechanism, a regular routine of actually turning it off to be present. And um, I I, I share this because this is kind of what I did and it worked for me. And I could go into 
you know, some of the stories of that, but I'll just leave it there for now. Just say that's, that's the idea of presence. And that's why we're trying to disrupt it with little habits. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that a lot of people are talking about right now at the time of this recording um, is the documentary. I don't know if you've heard of this, seen it on Netflix, the, the, uh, the social dilemma, but it's about, it's about our phones, you know, and, and just the idea that, that everything you're saying is, is true, that these things have been designed almost to take away our presence. Yes. Yes. And, um, and they're discipling us whether we realize it or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I confess I haven't actually seen it yet, but I, I know the arguments of it well. Yeah. And I have a lot of friends that have seen it and actually talked over it <laughs> um, <laughs> with people without seeing it yet. But it's helpful, I think, because and, and you know, other people are doing this, but what the social dilemma is doing, and hopefully, you know, my, my book is in a similar conversation, but more in the Christian category of thinking through what technology is doing, it's just sort of the the unveiling of the way the world actually is. Yeah. In, in a sense, I think what we're trying to do is pull the handkerchief off the magic trick or like, you know, pull, lift the curtain off the window and say, do you see reality as it actually is? Mm-hmm. And the way it actually is, is that technology is not neutral. It's not neutral. It's not just how you use it. it it's programmed to go somewhere. And that can be great. That can be great. It is often, however, programmed to use your attention to make money. You know, the reason so many things are free on the internet, I mean, some, some people don't have this, this is like a basic insight, but you know, for some people, technology is young, so it might be a revelation to them. The, the reason so much is free on the internet is because we are the product. We, our eyes, our attention is being sold to advertisers. You know, our attention is the product. So lots of these technologies are driven to get our attention so it can sell it to an advertiser. And this works, you know, like people keep doing it because it makes money. And so it's just, an, I think it's an important new way to look at the phone and be like, I don't want to be a product. And by the way, if somebody's constantly drawing my attention and sucking me in, is it, isn't that kind of like discipleship? I mean, isn't, you know, if, if they're constantly getting you to do what they want to do and, and getting you trained to look now and look at this and do this, I mean, we are formed in the image of what we gained at. And so we got to think about um, our patterns of scrolling, our patterns of uh, work on the computer, our patterns of watching shows and which ones and when, our patterns of media listening and checking and notifications. All these things are real issues of discipleship because they're real matters of attention and presence. Um, I think in a lot of ways, the sum of our life is what we pay attention to. Yeah. And if the sum of our life is a, a series of notifications, well, the phone has done a really good job of discipling us. Um, it would also suggest that if the church hasn't addressed that, the church is not doing a very good job of discipling if they're not talking about how do you use your phone. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, we're familiar with certain things, um, moral categories, like the church is interested in who and how you're having sex. <laughs> I mean, like it is, it, it's like it understands that the way people have sex is a moral issue. It changes you. It does made, like huge things to your life. Um, we, we understand that the way you consume alcohol or don't, or the way that you do drugs or don't, it's a moral issue. And church speaks into those things. Um, I think the phone is, you know, on that level. Yeah. It is one of the most, is either the greatest gift. I, I kind of uh, analogize it to sex often. It's, it can be one of the greatest gifts or one of the greatest dangers, depending on how you approach it. It's never neutral. And I think uh, the church has got to, you know, technology is young. So I'm not blaming like, oh, the church is missed. We've whiffed. I'm just saying this, we need to be in this conversation. We need to be in, how is it programmed? What is it trying to do to us? How can we use our phone like disciples instead of letting the phone disciple us? That is, you know, a really, really important question for our time. Yeah. Not to mention for our children's time, but before we even get into like, how do we train our kids in this? Well, the first thing to do is, how do we do it? You know, how do we train ourselves in it? Yeah. Wow. So you talk about technology, but other, uh, others of the, uh, the habits that you talk about in the, uh, the book, you talk about having a daily meal, uh, daily yeah. meal, and then, yeah. and then one hour conversation with a friend. Uh, once a week. I would love to know what kind of role does community play in our spiritual formation? Because a lot of times when we talk about spiritual growth, we just think that 
it's an isolated thing. It's us and God reading our Bible. Right, right. What kind of role does community play here? Or should it play? I'm, I'm really glad, yeah, we're going here because, you know, I could talk about technology all day and how it's discipling us and we need to get, yeah, do that. But, but there's, a, there's a whole other side to this and they really go together. It's not like opposite ends. But that is how are other people like it, the upshot of turning your phone off for an hour a day should be, well, who are you with? Maybe, maybe it's like a family dinner or maybe it's a conversation with your spouse. Maybe it's a quiet time. I don't know, but people in our life change everything, including our habits. So psychological research would tell you that you can't really change significant habits in your life without a community surrounding you. Um, there's awesome, there's phenomenal Alcoholics Anonymous research that shows that in order to change the stickiest addictive patterns, you know, like alcoholism, but, but phone addictions are similar. Um, you need a community around you to walk with you through it. And uh, um, that is significant. So even if you were just thinking about the surface level, oh, how do I change my habits? Well, you should know you got to do it communally. But there's a much bigger idea here. And that is the idea that we're made for each other. Um, we, Adam, this, this baffle, every time I say it, I'm, I'm like, is this really true? But it, it's in Genesis. I mean, Adam was lonely in the garden with God. So he is with God face to face. And God looks at him and says, it's not good for you to be alone. Like, what is God talking about? He's with, God is with him. You, you sort of think like, that's all you need, uh, me and Jesus or me and God. But, but actually, God made us to experience him fully only when we're in community. So this is why God gives Adam Eve. Um, and this is why we're called to a body of Christ. Like we only together do we experience the fullness of who God is. And that makes sense because God is a Trinity, right? But that, that should just be a massive indicator to us that ha all things in life, including habits, are best done communally. And so a whole other half of the kind of habits that I think and talk about are ways like what are the what are the, the default knee-jerk habits that can push us towards other people instead of just assimilating to the default knee-jerk habits that tend towards isolation and loneliness, which is, you know, the norm in America, at least. I mean, the norm in America is to become a busier, wealthier person who used to have friends, period. Like that's the slant that we're living on. Um, ideally, that's kind of like part of the American dream, but it's also part of the American nightmares. Yes, we have upward mobility. Yes, we're gaining things and gaining possessions and we're losing relationships and thus losing ourselves. And so you've got to know, just like the phone is not neutral, the culture we live in is not neutral. It is pushing us towards individualism. And when we live with the schedules we live, whether it's a, a busy lawyer like me or you know a busy soccer mom who's running from appointment to appointment, you know both of those, um, usually crowd out the idea of a family dinner. And so it's really significant, for example, just to take another small habit and say, what if we actually patterned our lives around a different center of our gravity? And it wasn't doing all the activities we can do. It wasn't adding every resume, you know, addition that we can. It was just, we'll, we'll do some of that, but, but the anchor of our life together as a family will be a daily meal. Maybe it's breakfast, usually it's dinner. You know, there's all kinds of, interesting sociological research about the impact of family dinners. I mean, it has like ridiculous outcomes from being the greatest predictor of Rhodes scholars, if you look at <laughs> who, who becomes these scholars, but also just emotional health, behavioral health, academic outcomes. For some reason, family dinners matter. And I think it's probably because we were designed to be together. And when a family is really functioning, it comes together as a regular ritual. And it's saying not that... Um, Again, not that we check this family dinner off because we want to be a good family, but it's saying we are living counterculturally to the regular hustle and bustle. We're saying life is worth stopping or organizing it so that the table is the center of the gravity, not the schedule. That's a, lots of things change. And, and we could talk about how it changes your kids and what to do during family dinner. But the idea of having a communal meal each day. For people who are single, you know, this might be a meal with your roommates or it might be a lunch in the cafeteria at work instead of a lunch at your desk. It can be a lot of things. But the idea of eating communally is an enormous shift um, from food as fuel to food as the center of community. 
you know, we're not machines that just need to be refueled. We are souls that need to be nourished. And when we come to the table, we don't just feed our bodies, we feed our souls. So there's a, there's a lot there, I think. Yeah. I love this because, again, so when we're recording this, we're right in the days of COVID, you know, pandemic and everybody's isolated at home. And so much of the conversation is, well, this is going to change everything. So more people will work at home. More people will be isolated. Church is going to be something you watch online. Right, 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 right. And you're saying this is something in a lot of ways we need to resist this. I think, I think we need to resist with every fiber of our being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, in our current moment, there is a, a dark irony to the, the idea that we actually have to remain distanced yeah. in order to love our neighbor. Yeah. And I would just say that makes right now really hard. Yeah. That is why we're seeing mental health problems right now. That is, that is why, I mean, um, pandemics are a crisis not the norm but when you extrapolate and say oh we can live this way it's actually functionally fine we can work from home we can do remote no 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 like we are losing something when we should name it we are losing each other right now and so there's two things to do one is to fight for what you can now and i've been having for example a lot of backyard fires with <laughs> friends a lot of backyard fires um because that is where the nourishment of community happens in real vulnerable conversation and i almost see fires as like a metaphor of friendship it's it's like if you light a fire in the backyard it's sort of where people want to be it's like oh who's there who's talking um it, you know life is being exchanged and at best like at best truth is being told um and we're at our best when we're vulnerable and telling the truth so you can fight for that now i mean there are ways to do it but the the second thing is we shouldn't we should realize that um this is like the opposite of the way we want to pattern life where we don't get together. What we're looking for is regular times where we rhythmically get together again, because the default pattern of life is to become more and more isolated. So it's interesting to be talking about this in a time of pandemic, but I think most of us would knee jerk agree that, Oh, one of the hardest things about this is just being disconnected from other people. It's certainly not something we're going to celebrate and pattern our life after in the future. It's, it's a pain to name that in order to love people for a moment, we have to remain distance. But it's also, I mean, I strongly encourage people and encourage their churches and their small groups, figure out a way to engage safely in embodied fashion. Um, a church service online is does not equal a church service. It might be a temporary patch. That's fine, you know. Um, it might be what we have to do to love our neighbor as well. But it's certainly not the norm for the future. It's certainly not what we look forward to the new kind of church being. No, 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 no. We're the body of Christ in all the, all the real sense of the word. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So, so let me ask you uh, just a, a few more questions here. So one is, so somebody's watching this, they're listening to this. This is brand new for them. They've never thought about yes. the power of habits and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, Justin, I'm in. How in the world do I get started? What would you say? Yeah. Well, um, might be a little gimmicky to say, well, get the book and read it, but <laughs> I, would, I would actually humbly suggest that or um, because I do try to give some on-ramps into this in the appendices of the book and try to say, you know, if you, if you want to move in this direction, there are different ways to do it. You could get together with your small group and try the common rule, all eight habits for a month. Or, uh, you know, more likely you could get together with a friend, accountability partner, spouse, disciple, or whatever, like, meaningful relationship you have. But again, communally. I actually never tell people to do this stuff alone. <laughs> I always tell people to try it in community. Um, and you could just try one habit. So there's kind of like a, if you've heard of the Whole30 diet or any sort of, like, major d diet, there's, there's a way to approach this where you're just like, okay, for 30 days, I'm going to do a detox. And I'm going to try all these habits. And if you're brave, I think it's awesome. Try it with a community. Um, on my, the website, thecommonrule.org, I actually have a video series for small groups to watch. It's free. You can just go online and watch it. And it leads you through the book. And you watch one five to seven minute video on each habit for a series of eight weeks. So, you know, could, easy way to go through it with friends. Um, but just so for most people, trying one habit for a period of a month is the best way to actually start. So the, the most simplest on-ramp would be get with your spouse or with your friend and say, let's try scripture before phone 
as a daily pattern for the next four weeks. And we'll talk about it. We'll keep each other accountable. You know, you miss a couple of days, no problem. We're not going to yell at each other. We're just, we're just trying to get to the habit point. Because after about four weeks, what happens is you wake up one morning and you don't think about going to your phone. Mm-hmm. You just need your go to scripture. You go to the couch and you have your coffee and maybe read a Psalm. And um, you suddenly realize, oh, you hit the habit point where now this is the default. That's what we're trying to get to. Because once you get to that point, scripture is now the rhythm of your life. You're, you're sort of in a, a pocket and it's not hard then to add another habit because you're not adding extra thoughts to your brain. It's sunk down to the basal ganglia, deep part of the brain habit level where you can add a new habit now and it's not hard. And so sometimes people are like, oh, these eight habits, I can't even keep track. How could I ever do them? Well, when they become habits, you're not thinking about them. Like you can do an amazing amount of habits every day. Um, and if you, I were to try to live like you, one day, or you were to try to live like me, it would be completely overwhelming, but not after a while, you know, we kind of get into it, a groove and that's formation, right? So mm-hmm. I encourage people to start with one, let it sink down and then think about adding another, but that's the way to, that, that's the kind of the way to approach it and always do it in community. Hmm. Yeah. And one more question there. Uh, and maybe you already referenced it in what you just said. So for the person that they're, they're just starting these things or one of them and, and it just feels odd, it feels clunky, it feels unnatural, how would you encourage them to keep going? Yeah, that one's an easy one. I'm, everything good I've ever done in my life was hard, clunky, and unnatural at first. Yeah. This is the way exercise feels. This is the way your first days, weeks, months, even years of marriage feel. Um, this is the way a new job feels. This is everything that's good for us it's hard, weird, clunky, and unnatural at first because it's habit change. And I, I always try to be really careful with this stuff. I am not trying to tell anybody that these habits are easy. They might be simple. Like scripture before, before phone is a simple idea, but it's not easy. It challenges everything about the way you spend your morning. That's the point. You know, doing a communal meal each day is simple, but it's not easy. It challenges everything about the way you arrange your schedule. Like having an hour of meaningful conversation every week with a friend is a simple idea, but it's one of the hardest things you'll do because it asks you to disclose yourself regularly on a weekly basis. So the idea here is um, they should feel like they're pushing back against who you are because that's the way sanctification feels. So I would say the way you get past that is through community. I mean, I, I always give up on stuff unless somebody else knows that I'm trying to do it and I need to report to them later. Even if it's like, you know, mm-hmm. I tell my wife, hey, today in the gym, I'm going to try to run a, a mile in under seven minutes. And, you know, part of me is thinking, well, I want to be able to say I did it. And that's not, that's not bad. Yeah. Um, that's not, that's not proving anything. It's just, we, you know, we have an idea of who we want to become. And then we get to that hard clunky moment. And we're like, I oh, forget it. It's too hard. But no, the, the best sense is like, we're, there's this vision out there that no, 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 we're going to do it. Somebody's calling us forward. Somebody who we want to, um, you know, in the basest way impress, but in the best way, just be accountable to. That's why accountability works. We need other people in our lives who know we're trying to do this. So kind of a long tangent to say, tell somebody else, you know, I'm trying to Sabbath every week, really. And I kind of like you to keep me accountable because it's going to feel clunky and hard and I need somebody to help me push through But the good news is it's not always clunky and hard. I I can tell you, I still live according to these habits and it's easy. It's easier than the way I used to live. Yeah. Now, though there was a lot of, you know, if you drive a stick shift, you know what it's like to change gears. Sometimes it can be really clunky, but um, not when you finally get in the new gear. That's then it just suits the speed that you're going. And so for me, you know, there's been a lot of clunkiness on the way, but the, the wisdom of habit is that it can become very, very under the radar, very unnoticed, but you're finally living in sustainable rhythms now. Yeah, that's great. Justin, I love it. I love the uh, book and just what you're challenging uh, us with. Uh, this has been so good. So if people who are watching, listening, and they want to they wanna maybe connect with you, what's a, what's a great way to do that? You referenced the website just a few moments. Yes. The, going on to the commonrule.org would be the best way um, to check it out. So they can they can reach me there. They can contact me there. They can get in touch there. And all, there's some social media from there, but that would be the best way to find me. Okay. 
All right. Awesome. Hey, Justin, this has been so good. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks out. a lot. Thanks. You bet. This has been great. Thanks, Mark.